We bought a Mercedes. The goal of this build is to really speed our process up a little bit and hone in on some of the things that Bill does really well. Part of that is Eric, the guy that uh, drove the car in for me and almost ran me over. He's gonna be helping me film, he's gonna be helping me edit and really up our production game and uh, up our speed on building. So that's kind of what this car is about. Well, what are we gonna do with it? Well, I'm gonna tell you, but before I get into that, let's talk about this car. This is the last of an era. This is kind of considered the, the final old school Mercedes before they went into kind of their new design language, their new engines, the new everything. This was it. This car ran from 89 to 2003 in this body style. We got it from 1990 until that time in the states and they really didn't change much everything that they changed was really small kind of details and you can tell i mean this car looks like it was designed in the early 80s and it looks like a classic mercedes it just it just screams classic mercedes even though this car was made in 1999 i think i think this is a 99 I'm not entirely sure. Well, you know what? Maybe I should tell you how much I paid for it first so that you will have some grace for what you're about to see. I paid $1,000 for this 99 SL500. 300 horsepower, V8 Mercedes with a drop top. I got it for 1000 bucks. Now, it was a little bit of a friend deal. I did have to trade a car. Uh, the car that I traded, I got off of a paint job that I did, so I didn't count that as real money, and we just won't count that as real money for the sake of the argument. If you want to count that, I paid $2,600 for this Mercedes. Now, that is a crazy deal, and it is a very good deal, even given the things that I'm about to show you. But just keep that in mind as we kind of look around and show you the issues. Uh, first is the interior. We are going to address this, but this interior is just filthy. I mean, it's just dirty. It smells a little weird, and I'll explain that later. But overall, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. There's a lot of tears, a lot of like somebody with really dirty hands and arms and elbows was driving it. Somebody who also thought this was like a good look for a Mercedes. This is kind of like a West Coast Customs uh, style floor mat. We'll leave those in. Um, and I mean, it's not really bad. It's just definitely not good. So we need some door mat. We need some door panels. We need to do something about these seats. We, we need to do something about everything. Also, and this, I think, just is par for the course when you buy an old Mercedes. We've got a little bit of a, a little bit of a Christmas tree. So we've got some stuff that we have to handle. There is a misfire. You may be able to hear. Well, you can't hear it up top, but it stumbles in the beginning. So we'll address that. It's trying to die. Ignore it. Twenty-five hundred dollar Mercedes V8 convertible. So, we will address all of those issues. If I can't fix them, I know a guy who can. Now, let's move on to the engine because that is the thing that is most exciting to me. That is what makes this car cool and fun. Uh, we've got some loose stuff going on. The hood release for these is inside the emblem. I guess that's to remind you that you have a Mercedes every time you open the hood. And there she is. Now, this is a 5-liter V8. Uh, a lot of people that I'm friends with said this sounds like a Mustang, and we will test that out uh, in a later video. But it, it, you get what you get. It's big displacement, 300 horsepower. You get it real early, and it just kind of stays there forever. It feels really comfortable to drive this thing very fast. Not that I have tested that, but I, I guess that it might. Um, there are some small issues with the engine like you heard, but overall it's in pretty good shape. It just needs some cleanup, like whatever this is is disintegrating. Oh, that's disgusting actually. I don't think I've ever touched it. So this, you can see, is just uh, literally disintegrating. But 99, what do you expect? Uh, that's good. Oh, uh, one thing we do need to kind of focus on is here you'll see the shock tower. I'm not sure if this has been replaced. We are going to go into the, into the suspension and do all that. But if I close the hood, Right here, you're gonna see where at some point our shock wasn't bolted down, and I'm guessing came up and just like hammered the hood into this really nice little uh, thing. So we're gonna have to fix that. Not really a big deal. Other than that, the body is in pretty good shape. The front bumper's a little rough. 
We've got a mirror that, uh, I think it's this one. Yeah, this mirror was replaced with some like reflective tape, though it seems that kind of towards the end of this car's life it wasn't taken care of, but it seems like probably for a lot of it it was. So the whole point of this build is to show you guys how to build your own custom car on a budget. And today we're gonna do two of my favorite things, and that is exhaust and wheels. That's why I'm holding this beautiful used muffler. I've got this muffler that I bought like a year ago for 80 bucks for my MGB and we're going to be using it on this car. Now the way to keep an exhaust system cheap is to use parts you already have. This car has two mufflers. It's got a resonator in the middle and then a big suitcase muffler on the back. We're going to take it to the exhaust shop, tell them, hey, we want to delete the resonator, put a pipe in there, and then replace the muffler with this and it should make this car sound absolutely insane. I think we're going to be looking at about $100 labor. $80 for a muffler, $180 for an exhaust on a car is not bad. And it's going to make this SL500 sound sick. Let's take it over there. I got a muffler in the back of the car that you can use. Okay. You just try to use But I'm trying to make it louder. It's got the stock muffler on there. All right, so I went last night and picked up the car. My exhaust guy got it done kind of late, so I had to go get it on the trailer. It got rained on, but I think it's okay. And the exhaust is done. Now, the best part about this, well, there's so many best parts, but one of the best parts is it was $40. We had already had the resonators done. Somebody had done it in the past. And so it was $40 to have my muffler put on, which brings us to a grand total of $120. And he even threw in a sick chrome exhaust tip. But that is not the best part. The best part is the way this thing sounds. Now this is a cold start, but just listen. So one of the most difficult and most expensive parts of any build is wheels. And the hardest part is picking the right ones. Now, the biggest thing you have to worry about to start with when you're looking for wheels is this. It's your PCD. There's two measurements that you need to know, and that is your lug pattern, your bolt pattern, which is your 5 by 114.3 on most cars. This is a 5 by 112. And the second is your inner diameter for your hub. Most of them are like 71 point something, but that's gotta be big enough to fit on your wheel or you're gonna have trouble. They do make adapters that are like wheel spacers. I've used them before and they do work, but it's best if you can get the actual PCD for your specific car. The next big measurement you have to deal with with wheels is your width. Now, there's a lot that goes into this because if you stretch your tires or whatever, it means you can run wider tires. But basically, you wanna know that your tire is gonna actually fit underneath your fender. Now, if you're new to this uh, and you're not really sure what width to go with, check the forums. Basically, every width has been run on every single car. We wanted a really wide car, so we picked an 11 inch wide wheel. And uh, as you can see, it's gonna be a really wide car. All right, so the next one is offset. And this is the most elusive one. And it's kind of hard to explain, but I promise it's simple. This is the mating surface where you actually bolt the wheel to the car. The offset tells you where this mating surface is in relation to the front and the back of the wheel. Now finding it is pretty simple and figuring out how to use it to your advantage is even easier. And I'll show you right now. All right, so to find your offset, you lay a straight edge across the back of your wheel and then take a tape measure and you're just going to put it on the face or the mounting surface of the wheel. Now ours measured six and three eighths inches, okay? A little bit of math that you gotta do here. An 11 inch wide wheel is actually 12 inches wide. So the midpoint of our wheel, of our 12 inch wide wheel is six inches. So since we have six and three eighths, that means that we have a three eighth inch positive towards the outside of the wheel or the, yeah, the face of the wheel offset. And a three eighths inch offset is equal to about 10 millimeters. So this is a 10 millimeter offset, 11 inch wide wheel, which means that it's pretty wide for a cast wheel. So this is the stock wheel. So if you're trying to figure out your offset, it's good to know what your stock offset is. Most stock wheels, if not all, have the offset imprinted here. So right here, it tells us this wheel is an eight and looks like one quarter J, that's the width, and then ET 34, which means it's got a 34 offset, that's positive. 
So when we're building our wheel, when we're trying to calculate what we need, it's important to know how far this wheel sits out with that offset. With that, we can then figure out how wide and how low our offset needs to be to get the width that we want. Now, if you still need some help figuring out your width and your offset for your specific wheels, there's calculators online. You can plug in some numbers and it's gonna tell you exactly what's gonna happen to your wheel, whether it'll move in or out based on your width and your offset. You'll hear seasoned drivers say this all the time, but easily, hands down, the best modification you can do to your car is a good set of tires. Tires are the thing that contacts the ground. If they're bad, your performance is gonna be bad. If they're good, your performance could be great. Continental hooked us up with some super sticky Extreme Contact DWS Pluses. Now this is the perfect tire if you need a performance tire all year round. It's super sticky even in the summer or winter months. It can handle rain, it can handle snow, and their Sport Plus formula means that you have longer tread life. So if you're an enthusiast that wants to be able to drive your car every day, this is the tire for you and that's why we chose it. So these wheels are already super wide, and if we were keeping this thing stock body, this fitment would be insane. We would have to do a lot of work to make these fenders fit, but we are not. We are going to be wide bodying this thing on a budget, and so we're going to need to use a little help from our friends called Spacers. Now we had to wait on them to come in, that's why I'm wearing something different, and we got two sets, a two inch for the rear and a one inch for the front. Now spacers are probably the most controversial thing that I do on the channel, and it's because of all the internet information. Now I've used spacers on daily drivers for years, and I've never had a single issue, but it is worth saying that they're probably gonna put more stress on your bearings and on your lug studs. You wanna make sure all of that is in good working order before you put a set of spacers on your car. Aside from that, anytime you lower the offset, whether it's spacers or really, really low offset three-piece wheels, you're gonna put more stress on your car. It's just the nature of the geometry. But you're also gonna widen your stance and lower your center of gravity, which is pretty cool. So we are gonna be using spacers on this car. Now, what we've got here is our 11 inch 265 tire on a two inch spacer with a 10 offset. So we should have a pretty wide wheel. My favorite part about this is I now have studs. Ah, that's great. Okay, we'll throw these on real quick and then we'll sit this thing on the ground and see what it looks like. I'm so excited. Will you just look at it? This thing went from mild to absolutely insane with the addition of that spacer. And the fitment I think is gonna be perfect for our kit, but we're not ready for that yet. We've gotta see what the front looks like all widened out and see what the stance of this thing is actually gonna be like when it's all said and done. Very, very excited. This is one of my favorite parts of any build. So this is gonna be our final stance. The only problem is it does not pass the shoe test. So we will sort that out later, but wideness looks insane. So we're gonna get the other side on, we're gonna get it out of the shop, we'll see how wide it actually is, which I think is gonna be crazy, and then we're gonna get it down the street and we'll do some rollers, get some shots of that. I'm so excited, let's do it. kit on our Mercedes because no one makes a kit like this for this car. We're going to adapt it and make it work so that it all flows and makes sense and everything and I'm going to show you guys how to do it with the help of some friends that you guys will meet throughout the video. Let's get to work. How many? I say one. Three. My name
name is Dan Santana, Danger Dan 4 on Instagram. I'm an artist, illustrator, graphic designer. I mess with cars when I'm not supposed to because I'm horrible with them, but I like to modify them and Caleb inspired me to modify some cars, so I'm here to help do that. Uh, I've done a lot of the artwork that you guys have seen on Bill, uh, a lot of the stickers, the shirt designs that you guys have seen, uh, the majority of the car illustrations and stuff like that. Uh, and the future illustrations for Bill that you guys will probably get. So I offer design services, logo services, illustration services. Uh, my Instagram, you can reach out to me for any graphic design or illustration stuff. I sell stickers, Southern Import Collective if you want stickers. Uh, some of you guys might recognize me from uh, the Audi A4 Avant build with Eurospec Bodega, so I'm part of them as well. But yeah, I like to draw and work on cars, essentially. And I drove two hours to get here because Caleb said, come wide body your car. Alright, so when you mount these, it's really important they go at the right spot. Too high and you'll have trouble getting your car low enough to look right. Too low and your car will never look right no matter how high or low it is. So it's really important that you get them to, to kind of center where the wheel well is supposed to be. On this car, uh, we're basically just leveling this off with the inner wheel well, the fender well, and then mounting it there. That's how we got our front position and our back position. That, may, that's, that way, when we start lowering it or raising it, whatever, it's going to look right with the rest of the car. And it's just the easiest way to do it. So I just line it up with the wheel well and, uh, and then use that to kind of decide where it needs to go. Now, we have cut this one already but I have some different markers that I use uh, to make sure they both look the same. For this car, I want the line right here to carry from the bottom of the door handle to the top of the tail light. So we're just gonna line that up as best as we can with tape and we'll mount it. So I use tape to check all my lines. So I'm gonna line this up on this kind of fender line we have now. And we're gonna run it to the top of the tail light just to make sure that this carries smooth into there. You won't see it up close when you're standing back on the car. You'll be able to tell that it all kind of lines up and works together. Just hold it right there on the handle. We'll tighten up our tape mounts. And that's more or less going to be where our fender goes. And you'll see it wants to pull away. You can use more tape, but I have friends here. So I'm going to have somebody hold it in place. We'll run some screws in it just to keep it there. Uh, you can use Clico pins or whatever if you want. A lot of people tell me that all the time. I know, but sheet metal screws are here. So that's what we're gonna use. I'm you. spotted you. You're not fast enough. What? Yeah, I gotta, I gotta put that piece on. What do you think about it? Thumbs up or thumbs down? My name's James. Um, I am the owner of Carnivore's YouTube channel and Facebook group community, and I host car meets. Uh, do a little bit of everything, uh, but that's what Carnivore's is. It's a brand of people who are hungry for cars. So yeah, me and my brother started Carnivore's uh, a couple years ago. It was inspired by you, Caleb. The MR2 showed up when you were putting the um, Ferrari diffuser on it and that was the video so this is the earliest video I can remember um, and ever since then sub watched every single video since then so that's how long I've been a fan but the reason why you inspired us is because you showed us that you don't really have to know what you're doing you just got to do it and once you start documenting it you'll learn and you'll get better and that's exactly what you did uh, but yeah so I'm, I'm happy to be here I drove eight and a half hours Caleb put out the PSA said hey Yo, somebody wanna come wide body a car? Come down. And I was here in a second, so I wasn't missing this opportunity. Dan's gonna be over here working on a template. So we have some gaps where we cut out body lines for this fender. So we're just gonna lay out some blue tape, trace it out, cut it out, and then we'll transfer that over to this flat piece of fiberglass. So we cut out some more uh, little template pieces from our sheet, and uh, they'll just go in right here. Glue these in place for now. I'm gonna use some fiberglass filler to do that. All right, man, shout out to Caleb for having a good eye. This is a S13 spoiler for the, the coupe. And look how close this lines up, or how good it lines up, look at that. That's on there. You can't, you can't do any better than that. So we're gonna mount this, and uh, it looks phenomenal. My name's Justin Beek, I'm from Kirsten, Indiana, little town north side of Indiana. Um, drove a little over 10 and a half hours to get here. 
Mercedes, the favorite, favorite thing about it, it's not the car itself. It's what it brought us all here to do. This brought me out of my comfort zone. It uh, brought us all together as a group to do something for the good. All right, so we are going to build out a front piece to make this work. You can see the BMW headlight would have started right here, and we want it to go all the way to the new Mercedes headlight. And the way we're gonna do that is with packing tape. So we'll just lay the packing tape over, and we're gonna keep layering this stuff up until it makes the shape we want, and then we can lay fiberglass directly over that, and we'll have a part. All right, so we've got our basic shape made. You can see now it looks like the fender comes all the way to the headlight, even though it actually stops about right here. And we're gonna make a fiberglass part. Now it's going to be a rough part, and that's really all we need. We can smooth it out later. So I'm going to get two layers of fiberglass so it's not too thick. I've got a mixing cup here. We're going to use resin to make really just basic fiberglass. We'll push all the air out with this little chip brush. You can get these for like 79 cents at Walmart, and uh, we'll let that cure. Once it cures, we can pop it off and bond it to our fender, and we'll have a complete part. If that didn't make any sense, it will when you see it happen. Let's do it. So it's about 10 drops per ounce. We'll do about 70 drops because we have somewhere around uh, seven ounces. So we're gonna start with just like a primer coat and uh, this is just resin. You could protect your paint right here but we're gonna be painting the bumper anyway so I'm not super worried about that. But this is gonna make sure that the fiberglass cloth actually sticks when we put that first layer on. It'll soak this up and stick to the, to the surface. Then we just press this on. It's a lot like vinyl in that it's gonna wanna bunch up and stuff, but this mat over the, um, over the cloth, like woven cloth you can get is good because there's a binder in here that breaks up with resin. So as you put resin on it, it's gonna break up and conform a lot better. This is a piece, we'll break it off of there. It does not stick to the plastic, which is awesome. Uh, we did push it up inside to get that rolled edge, which is cool. We can pull all this off and you'll see that like, the fiberglass, which is not great on paint, didn't do anything to our paint. It's all, well, I got some right there. We'll have to sand that off. But it's all real clean and awesome and good. So what we'll do next is we'll trim this up, get all the loose glass off, and then we will stick it on right there and we will have an extended fender. That was nice. There we go, so we'll just glass from the back right here where all these pieces are glued in and they will be permanent and then we will have a part. How cool is that? How neat is that? Alright, so we have waited overnight and this stuff is totally dry. So we're going to pop it off, we'll trim it, we will bond it to the fender, and then we will have a custom fender. Does it look brighter in here to you, Eric? A little bit, yeah. There we go. All right, so you'll notice we hit this with a grinder. Anytime you're gonna bond to fiberglass, or really bond to anything, you need to key the surface. And keying means you're putting like little teeth in there. So I use a grinder because it's fast. You can use sandpaper or whatever, but that'll make sure that this has something to grab to. We also did it to the back of our part that we're bonding. Um, that way it has something to grab to there as well. And if you do that, it'll hold forever. It's a mechanical bond, not a chemical one, but it'll hold forever. 
All right, so we got a successful bond here. All the screws are out and the fender will just pop off. If you look from the back, you can see a lot of material is bonded onto our fender. This is never gonna go anywhere. We may reinforce from the back if we feel like it, but I just don't think it's gonna be necessary. We'll smooth all this out in a later step. First, we gotta make some clearance for these wheels. So pretty much every wide body I've ever done has required us to take the fender wells out, mostly because of how low the cars run, but also doing all this cutting and stuff, it's just not practical. There are some disadvantages, but if you're doing this to your car, you're not worried about rock chips and stuff. So we're gonna get these, get rid of these. It's gonna give us more clearance and allow us to really make sure that everything's real smooth up in here um, so that we hopefully don't scrub while we're driving around at our super, super low ride height. this thing out get it outside kind of look at it from far away see what that looks like because it's been a while since we've done that and then maybe take it on the road and just try to drive it and see what happens So we've only made it out of the parking lot. Oh, you know what? I did it again. What? I did not tighten down the lug nuts on the front wheels. Uh, yeah, we're gonna just flip around real quick. Oh, it's starting to start freaking raining on us. How frustrating. Yep, it's sprinkling. Oh. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Dude, this car. I think they were yelling at me. This car feels good. It feels like a lowered car. Try not to hit anything. It works! So basically all rear quarter panels are two pieces. And so when you do this cut to make room for your big wide body wheels, you have to put them back together. The way I do that is I make these relief cuts and hit them with a really big hammer and it pushes them back up into our new cut. But we still have to seal this thing off from water and we need to rejoin them so that it's structurally sound again. So we're gonna clean this up with a grinder. We're going to weld all these little tabs to the quarter panel again so it becomes one piece and then we'll cover it with some fiberglass filler to make sure it's watertight and just kind of finish off the look of this inner fender. It's gonna be really, really nice. Uh, I think we're ready to get to work. Let's gear up. finished up all of our welding and put on some fiberglass filler. It doesn't look pretty and you could make it look pretty if you really wanted to. I just don't really care. I'm only putting that stuff on for waterproofing and to make sure everything is sealed up. So I don't care if it looks pretty. It's underneath the fender. You'll never see it. And with that, we are done with our fender modifications. This is huge. This is probably the most stressful part of doing any wide body. Getting your fenders cut, getting all this new stuff to fit and still being able to turn the wheels and all of that other stuff without anything rubbing. It's really, really difficult, but fortunately for us with this car, it was actually super simple. So with the rear fenders all sealed up and done, with the front fenders cut and all of our wheel arches or wheel uh, liners removed, our car is ready to go for a drive at its new height. All right, so we have this thing all the way modified. We've got our fenders cut, welded up, everything is good to go, and it's lowered as much as we can possibly lower it. So we gotta test the suspension out. We gotta make sure this thing's actually going to work. So we brought it to basically the worst roads in our town, which is all of our downtown roads. A lot of bumps, a lot of dips, a lot of potholes. We're gonna drive it around and just see how it handles that. And then we'll get it down the road a little bit, take some turns and see how it feels. So far though, we've been really impressed. Well, we made it a block. 
uh, and it overheated. As you can see, that's coolant. It's supposed to be inside the car, and it is no longer inside the car. It started steaming like crazy out of the vents. I don't know why. Now, our original coolant leak came from the front of the car. This one's a different one. So, yeah, we're a little bit stranded. Maybe it was air in the system. That's what I'm kind of hoping. I doubt it, but maybe. So what we're going to do is ride over to Eric's house, which is like a block that way, and get some coolant, put some coolant in it, and just see what happens. Hopefully it works. Hopefully it starts. Let's take your favorite carnivores t-shirt, wipe it down, just get all that out of there, and then you just stuff it in right there. Okay, where are we going, Eric? Just a block over a block and then to the right. And to the right. Yep. Okay. All right, we're we're in a normal operating temperature. Let's try to get this light. This is fine. We're fine. We're gonna be okay. I thought I had all the overheating issues solved, but here we are, and it's it's maintaining temperature now. What is going on? Very lucky to be right next to Eric's house. You can see our front bumper is kind of busted. It's, there was an attempted repair earlier, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, but we're gonna modify it just a little bit, uh, make it a little bit cooler. I really like stock bumpers typically. Uh, I just normally make them a little more aggressive. So that's the plan for today. I'm gonna show you how to do it. This bumper is plastic, which makes things a little bit different than fiberglass. Um, but I think it's gonna be really quick. I don't think it's gonna take that long, maybe a day, maybe two. Uh, and we'll have a custom bumper and it'll just be done. That's my plan anyway. So Dan, AKA quiet on the set guy, uh, was here helping me with his car and he had this. This is a busted front lip off of his A4, but it's the same kind of plastic and I think it's gonna work for this car. My plan is uh, to take it and put it on right here. And as you can see, it kind of runs this whole length. And I think we can cover up all the damage with this uh, it'll give us kind of a little bit more aggressive kind of front lip area. Um, it doesn't fit exactly, but it's plastic, and plastic is super flexible, so I think we can make it fit and glue it in place, and it'll hold just fine.
next move is going to be unscrew everything. We'll prep our surfaces just with like a, a, a grinding wheel or something. Just got to get it real scuffed up and rough. Um, and then we will bond it. The bonder that I use is called JB Plastic Weld, and uh, I don't know what's in it, but it is just really good at bonding the plastic. And uh, I've used it for a couple of different bumpers, and it's worked really, really well. What I'm hoping though is that uh, all of this will bond really well. We'll be able to clean it up a little bit and then we'll kind of wipe it with some filler, just a real thin layer of, of body filler to kind of smooth that transition out a little bit better. And then I think we'll be good to go. So I will say this, this is not like a proven method. I've never done this before, like joining a front lip to a front bumper. Um, so I don't know if it'll last forever. I don't know if it'll last for a day, we'll see. But one of the things I really enjoy is trying things out and doing new things and coming up with my own processes for things. Sometimes it works out, most of the time it doesn't. But, <laughs> but this looks good for now. We'll see if it stays that way. We've got it in the paint booth here. You can see I added this uh, front lip on the front. That is actually from like garden trim edging. I didn't film it on this because I want you, if you're interested in figuring that out, go watch this video. I think it's gonna be on this side of my head. It might be on this side. Either way, um, it is one of the first videos I made on the channel, one of the first mods I ever did on Project Snowflake for the real OGs. And uh, it's basically just a piece of trim you can get at like your local hardware store. And it looks really, really good. You don't even have to paint it. We're painting this so it all matches. So here we are, everything looks good. You can see I kind of cut this at an angle. That's just to level the bumper out. The front end kind of lifted up a little bit and I just didn't like the look. So we added the garden trim stuff down here, cut an angle on it, it's all flat. Now, now we just gotta paint it. For jobs like this, I like single stage. It's gonna be a gloss color, very simple. So we're gonna mix up some single stage, spray it on the bumper and it should look really sick. I'm just gonna show this to you guys on a time lapse. Let's do it. We waited overnight. This thing is totally dry now. And it honestly looks really, really good. Super happy. It's not perfect, as you can probably see. But it's close enough to perfect for me, and that is all that matters. car is sick and today we are going to be doing a little bit of work to the wide body. So these are really easy to put on, you just give them a toss. So it's as easy as that, you can throw them on but I think we'll be sure to screw the other ones on because that was a little bit aggressive. So this is the first time we've put the fenders on since lowering the front. We knew the front looked really low, but with the fenders on, you can really see how low it actually is. And uh, it's super low. I'm hopeful that we still have clearance, but it is really close. I think we'll be okay. I think we'll be okay. But turning and stuff is the real if here. I've already cut this flat. This is gonna be for pushing the fender back so we get some more clearance on the back side. Um, but yeah, we're just gonna have to, I guess, drive it around and see what happens. 
in just a minute. The back looks pretty good and uh, it could actually come out a lot. We could come out a lot with the rear. So we're gonna figure something out with that. We still gotta trim some stuff off of there um, and then figure out what we wanna do with the rear wheel setup. If we can get it to go wider, we can. I don't know if we'll be able to. I don't know, we'll see. Overall though, it looks sick. All right, so what we're gonna do real quick before we get into body working these things is do our final trimmings. We gotta trim up around our headlights, our rear bumper, like everything's gotta look right before we start actually trying to smooth everything out. This thing should look more like it fits this car. All right, so my favorite way to go about this is the fastest way. It's also the most messy, which is why we brought this thing outside to do it. We've got everything trimmed up and this kit is looking like it belongs on this car now, but uh, it's still really rough. So we're gonna take a grinding wheel. Mine's really used, but you can use a new one. And we're gonna grind down all the dark green stuff, that filler that we put on last time. We're just gonna get it as smooth as we possibly can. We'll come back over that with more filler later. And since we're running out of daylight, that'll probably be it for today. We'll check back tomorrow and uh, get some more sanding done. All right, so it's a new day. It's a much colder day, which means, well, it means two things. One, me and Eric are both freezing. Uh, but two, the fiberglass is going to take longer to cure. So the good thing about that is it means we have plenty of working time to get everything real smooth. The bad thing is it's going to take longer to cure. If you're one that freaks out when you see me loading this stuff up on the fender, know that most of it gets sanded off. It is just a finishing surface, just a lot harder than body filler. So it just kind of adds some structure to all the cuts and pastes and stuff that we did to make these fenders fit. I feel a lot more comfortable uh, with this stuff over body filler. We will use body filler, we'll use a little bit, um, but the majority of like the real big fixes, the real big crimes we need to hide will be done in this. So we're just gonna go over everything we sanded last night, uh, make it all real smooth, something in my eye, we're okay. Um, and then we'll go over it with 40 grit sandpaper. That's gonna be kind of our final shaping pass. And then we'll be ready to uh, start filling and getting everything ready for paint, which is pretty exciting. We've got this hole here. I just forgot to make this piece big enough like I did on the other side, and I wanna fill it. Now, there's a couple ways we could do it. We could make a piece like we have been and graft it in and all that. I'm gonna do it a quicker way, and some people might not like this, but it does work. Um, I've had it on a car. Actually, the MR2 had a spot just like this um, that I fixed this way, and uh, it lasted the whole life of that car, with me anyway, which was like two years. So what we're gonna do is just take some tape, and lay it, lay it back here. All right, I think I'm going to pull, you know, I'll go around these screws and I'll fill that later, I think. Uh, what do I want to do? What do I want to do? I don't know. know. The time's ticking. Know, the time is a ticking. I know, I know. So for this, we're just gonna go yonk, 
just like that. And uh, that's gonna give us a, a surface and we'll come back behind it and put some actual fiberglass on it just to make sure it's solid and bonded. But you see now, no more hole. Pretty cool. All right, so this stuff is set up. It's dry now. We're gonna hit it with some 40 grit, which is really, really rough, and we're gonna take it down. Now, you'll see some dark spots as I'm sanding. Those are the low spots. We'll come back and fill those one more time with fiberglass filler before we move to the body filler like Bondo. Uh, but this is gonna give us a really smooth surface. It's kinda gonna finish everything out for us and make this thing look really good. <laughs> It's been a couple of days since you guys last saw me work. I have just been sanding a lot and our kit is just about ready to go back on the car for the last time. We'll do body work and everything uh, after that. But before we get into that, I wanted to take care of one more problem we have, which is our spoiler. This spoiler fits really, really well, but there's one place it doesn't and that's right here where it kind of meets the body. So I want to fix that. Uh, this is called a contour gauge. I don't use it very often, but it's really useful for things like this. And what I'm going to do is take this and just push it down against the car. And what that does is it gives us a perfect outline of the shape. Now, we've done a little bit of a cooking show here and I've already cut the shape out. This is it. I'm still cutting off this piece of fiberglass that I made early on in the build. Um, and we cut the shape out right here and you can see it fits just perfectly next to the car. So, next step, we're going to trim this down We'll push it up inside of there, screw a piece in, and fiberglass over it. And when we get done, it'll look like this. So you can see now we have a very nice fitment. We'll actually have to trim this back a little bit so it doesn't mess up our paint. But we have a very nice fitment here. This is all smooth. We can pull our screw out, and we'll have a finished piece. We'll have to reinforce that from the back just to make sure nothing breaks off or cracks or anything like that. But it's a very easy job, and now the spoiler actually fits the car. We're going to permanently mount these fenders. I'm kind of tired of doing the bolt-on fender thing, and I just like the way it looks when there's no bolt. So to do that, we're going to have to basically make this fender removable, which is an issue because this fender has hidden bolts. So we're going to go ahead and pre-remove the hidden bolts, and that way if you do have to remove this fender for whatever reason, it'll come off with the over fender attached rather than having to cut your over fender up just to get the fender off. So check out how good this thing looks. It looks really awesome. There actually used to be a giant hole in it. That's what our gas tank was for the E36. And now it's just a smooth fender. Really awesome. So we did do a lot of sanding here. As you can see, we've got a pretty smooth transition down into the fender now. Get it lined up correctly. And that fits like it should. A few more things to fabricate uh, just to make these fit really perfectly and then we'll be off to body work and get ready for paint. Super exciting. So we're going to take the filler and just go over anything that has fiberglass on it but we just wanna have something there to really make sure that when we do put some really shiny paint on this fender, it's gonna be flat. All right, so we let this stuff kick. It's still a little bit soft. It hasn't hardened all the way, and that is the best time to get out this thing. This is a cheese grater, and it's exactly what it sounds like, and it'll really shave off a lot of time when you're doing body work. Filmed in front of a live ostrich. Ha <laughs> ha! We're gonna take this, we're gonna shave down all of this kind of uh, rough stuff on top. Then we'll hit it with a guide coat and sand it. And it'll make sanding go a lot faster and uh, make shaping just so much more fun. Now we're going to take some black spray paint and use that as a guide coat. As we start sanding, it's gonna show us all of our low spots. We can make sure that we block it down to the right spot so that it looks good when it's in paint. 
The whole point of putting the black paint on there is so that when you sand it, you can see what the body is actually doing, if it's actually flat. When you get done sanding, or when you get done with your first pass, you'll see we've got these kind of black spots everywhere. And that shows me these are low spots. We've either got to block those down some more or fill again in these certain areas and then flatten them out. This right here is actually a high spot where we've sanded through all the paint and through the Bondo. And so we know that we've got to do a little bit more work here. This is where our gas door was. We've got to do a little more work here before this panel is completely flat. If we painted it right now, we would have some waves and we'd have these little divots that you would see underneath the paint. It would look really awful. So we'll have to pass over this one more time and then it should be completely flat. All right, so as you guys have noticed, our quality has gone up an insane amount, and that's because FJ Eric is filming for me, but he's not here every single day, and so it gives me chance to do like some of the really monotonous, boring stuff off camera, and that is exactly what I've been doing. I've spent the past two and a half days filling and sanding and filling and sanding three or four times on these fenders, and that means that they are done. The fabrication is complete. What you see is going to be the final kit, and that means that the next step is paint, which we are super, super stoked for. Hi, I'm Caleb. This is my friend FJ Eric. Uh, if you've been wondering why the content's been so good recently, he's the reason. We'll link his channel up there. He drives an ambulance. We are going to go through this thing, sand the whole thing down with 120, get it ready for primer, try to get it in primer today so that we can block it and sand it and paint it tomorrow. Not ambitious at all. We got this. <laughs> all right, Eric. Why are you yelling? This is what we're gonna do. So we're just gonna knock everything down. We gotta make sure that this thing's not shiny at all so that the paint will actually stick to it. So we got 120 on these sanders, these orbital sanders. The only rule here is keep the sander flat okay. and don't hit the edges. Anywhere where there's like a raise, like in the hood, don't touch them. We'll hand sand that stuff. And that's really it. We're gonna hit the whole thing. Once the whole thing's hit, it'll be ready for primer and we'll be good to go. is we'll come back with uh, hands, uh, our hand sanders, our blocks, and really just our hands on some of this curved stuff, and just knock down the rest of the gloss off this car. And then we will be ready to take this thing over to my house where we'll tape it and prime it. All right, so you've got to clean the car before you paint it. That seems pretty obvious. You don't want dust in your paint, even your primer. Uh, you want the smoothest finish possible. But the issue with this is that water is the enemy of paint. You'd think dust would be the biggest enemy, but in my opinion, it's water. You get water in your lines, you get water in the paint from the ground or whatever, or if it comes flying out of the door jams and into your paint, it's gonna mess up your day. It's very difficult to fix, especially in the clear coat stage, uh, but even in primer. So what we're gonna do is clean this thing. Uh, a lot of people will wash them with like Dawn soap, which is a really good thing to do. It'll degrease the car. Um, but you have to kind of, you really need to let it dry overnight for that, and we don't have that kind of time. So I'm going to just take a damp rag, we're going to wipe the whole car down, we'll go over it two times with the damp rag, and then we'll degrease it with an actual degreaser right before primer. So we'll know this thing is completely clean, no dust, no oil, no nothing, um, and it will hold, the primer will stick and hold really, really well. A lot of work to this thing. Yeah, so obviously this is not how the primer comes out of the gun. Uh, it needed still a lot of work. This primer that we're using is called a slick sand. It's like a super, super high build. So you can literally fill like pinholes with it and flatten everything out. So I sanded the whole thing for about four hours Daddy, yesterday. Yo. I'm going inside and you go inside. Okay, let me get let me hold you for just a second. Yeah, so we went over the whole thing yesterday with a block and some 400 grit. So the parts that we've sanded, you can see are super smooth. And it's really important because anytime you paint, uh, whatever is whatever you can feel, you're gonna be able to see. And if you get an imperfection underneath the paint, you're never gonna be able to fix it. If stuff falls in the paint, like dirt or whatever, you get some orange peel on the surface, no big deal, you can wet sand and polish that out. But if it's underneath, then you will have it forever. And I learned that the hard way with a few paint jobs I did, 
where I sanded, but I didn't do what I think is the most important step. Come over here and I'll show you. And we're just gonna take this block. I'm using a really long one so that it's smoother across a longer distance. If you use a shorter block, you still might have some waves. The longer the block, the less wavy it's gonna be. And we're just gonna hit this. And I'll stop right there and you can see this kind of orange peel texture. Now, if I did not sand this back, or if I didn't go any further than that, you would see this in the paint. But I can see because there's still guide coat and because we have kind of these, uh, this orange peel texture, this is not actually smooth, but this up here is. So we're gonna keep sanding this until all of that black is gone. Well, it's kind of like a brownish color, like this stuff right here. Let me help you a little bit. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Hold this side. No more black. All right, so after you've blocked the whole side, it'll look something like this. This side is super smooth and uniform. You'll notice these green and black spots. The black is where I've sanded through into the fiberglass underneath. The green is actually some glazing putty that's really, really thin and self-leveling. So it covers up like pinholes and stuff that you get when you do filler. If air gets in your filler, your fiberglass filler, whatever, uh, it'll fill that in. And that's really great for fiberglass parts because you tend to get some air pockets. So we went ahead and did that and uh, filled that in, sanded it down. Now this is all really smooth, but paint's a little bit translucent, especially light paint. So we're gonna be using silver uh, as our base layer on this car, and it's, pretty, it's a pretty easy uh, color to see through. So what I don't want is for these spots to show through in our final paint job. If they do, they'll be there forever. So we're gonna hit it with some primer. That'll make everything the same color, and that way when we spray over everything, even if we do get a little bit of, of spot where maybe there's not as much coverage or full coverage, um, it won't be very noticeable because you won't have these spots underneath the paint. All right, we've got this thing back in the shop and I'm really, really stoked about it. It's very clean, everything is gray, and it's been sanded down with 600 grit. So it should look really, really smooth. Uh, like, I, like we showed you, we used guide coat to make sure everything was flat. I think this is gonna be probably the best body works car I've ever done and likely the best painted, but there's one major issue. You hear the hissing uh, over here beside me. Uh, it's a heater because it's cold today. Uh, we took a temperature, a uh, uh, reading with our infrared therm thermometer, thermostat, thermometer, thermometer and uh, the building was 41 when we got in here. It's about 52 right now, which is decent, but it's still really cold for paint. So we've got this one heater running. We're gonna cut it off before we start spraying because paint fumes will ignite. Um, before we do clear though, we're gonna have to really heat this building up because the worst paint job I've ever done was in a situation like this where it was really cold and I was trying to paint a car and it just, the clear coat will run like crazy if it's cold. So we're really gonna have to work on getting it warm before we get to clear. But before we get to clear, we've got a surprise. We're actually painting this car more than one color. So the first step is going to be to base coat the whole thing. That's what we're going to do uh, now. Uh, I've got a cough drop in, so does Eric. This is a trick for you guys that paint uh, at home, maybe not at home. Uh, respirators dry out the air. They're filtering the air, so they dry it out. It makes your throat hurt. If you use a cough drop while you spray, it fixes it. I've learned that on a forum somewhere. So we got cough drops in, we've got the car clean, we've got our hoses routed and run, we've got our mixing station set up, more prepared than I've ever been for a paint job, and I went ahead and cleaned this whole area and added uh, a bunch of random lights everywhere. So hopefully we ought to see a little bit better than we have in the past, and this will just go a little bit smoother.
right, so this thing's been drying for about an hour, and honestly, it looks really, really good. We had some issues with the gun while we were painting, and we got them sorted out, so it's not, they didn't cause that much drama with the paint job, but one of the things I am really happy with is the bodywork. There's almost always an issue with bodywork, and I'm sure there's an issue with this bodywork too that we'll see when we get in the sun, but overall, it looks way better than anything we've done so far. So, I am getting better at bodywork, which is super encouraging. Really, if you look at this car, you may be able to see it on camera, but flat color really shows imperfection. So there's a lot of new cars coming out that you can special order with like a flat paint on it and it's like a $5,000, sometimes $10,000 option. And I don't think what people understand is that as soon as that paint scratches, you're gonna see it. Um, if there's any imperfection over the years, like you're gonna see it immediately. So there are some imperfections that I can see. I think the clear coat will kind of hide them. I don't know, we'll see. But we're not actually ready for clear coat yet. We have one more step and it's a step I've never done and I'm really nervous about it. Let me show you. Tape. I've never put tape on base coat. Now the data sheet for this says that it can have tape on it in 45 minutes and we've waited an hour because it's a little bit cooler out today, about 60 degrees in here, uh, maybe like 55. So I'm going to test a section before we just go off and tape this thing. We wanted to make this paint a little bit wilder and we're going to and you guys will see that in just a couple minutes. It'll take us a couple hours. Um, but first, we just got to make sure the tape's not going to pull paint off. So I want to go somewhere kind of discreet. Let's see. We'll go right here. And uh, this is behind the grill normally, so it won't matter if we pull the paint off here. And it shouldn't pull off, but I don't know. I've never done this before. It's really, really nerve-wracking. Make sure that's pushed on there really good. Very clean. Awesome. I guess we're good. Awesome. And for the first time doing multicolor base coat, I think we did pretty good. There's some taping mistakes that I made that led to some overspray that I had to get off, but it's not going to matter for the rest of the livery, and we'll get into that later. Overall, though, really, really cool. I'm a big fan of that thin, like, fine line tape. That stuff worked wonders on the back of the car, and I think this thing's going to look absolutely insane. This is not the whole livery, this is just the part that we're doing in paint. <laughs> some vinyl to straighten out some edges and make some kind of graphic details on the car and to do that we're gonna need some tools so vinyl wrapping is really easy and the easiest part of it is that you don't really need any safety equipment you don't need any special tools it's all very normal stuff masking tape to mask out all of your uh, graphics this is knifeless tape this is like the only specialty tool we're gonna use and that just allows us to cut graphics without putting a knife on the paint that's important to me a straight edge I, you can get these from like Hobby Lobby, wherever, hobby stores. Um, a self-healing cutting mat, which is all cutting mats. Measuring tape, also for marking out our graphics. And then this, uh, this is actually 3M 1080 vinyl, or I think it's called 2080 now, the newer version. And uh, this is the same stuff I used on the Audi. It's very easy to work with. There's air channels in it, so you can push all the bubbles out and you won't get wrinkles in your vinyl. And uh, overall, it's just one of the best products on the market. If you're doing vinyl for the first time and you've never done it before, um, I definitely recommend spending your money here because it pays off an insane amount with an experience. 
So with all of that ready to go, we are ready to mark out our livery and finish designing this car, and this is really going to set the car off. Now you might have noticed in the beginning of this video that we put the bumper back on. I try to throw you guys off the scent by painting that thing black, but also that's part of our livery. All of this is gloss black, uh, 3M, 1080, and 2080 film, and it's going to match our bumper perfectly. Very, very exciting stuff. So we're going to start out with the hood, get that out of the way. It's some really big kind of long pieces, uh, and then we'll work our way down the fenders and to the back. I think this is going to look crazy. Let's do it. doesn't have a motor in it. Yeah. But your Porsche has a motor in it. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I always, I always go in your bag and you put my hand on it.
All right, so this is a single stage. I had a lot of people ask me about this paint the last time that we used it. And basically it's just like your base coat clear coat, but without the clear coat. The clear coat is kind of built into the color. Now, this is actually really, really great stuff. And I do love using it if I'm not using metallic. We use a single stage on the truck behind me and it's a metallic and it worked pretty well. It looks really good, uh, but it's very easy to get streaks there and it's hard to fix them, unlike with base coat clear coat. So if I'm using a gloss paint, I do like to use single stage. You can use any brand. This is Nason. I normally use PPG, but any name brand single stage is going to look really really good. You just spray it on and you're done. So if it's your first time painting, maybe you're nervous about all the different coats and procedures and dry times, single stage is probably a pretty good way to go. We're going to mix this up real quick, spray it on the bumper. I'm just doing this because wrapping that because of all the little lines and stuff is going to be really miserable. So we're just going to spray it. We don't have to worry about it anymore. So this is the activator. Uh, basically this mixes in a four, two, one. So four parts paint, two part activator, no, one part activator, two parts thinner. Um, and the activator is just like what you use for clear coat that makes the clear coat kick and harden. Um, this is what gives that glossy hard shine that you would expect from like a base coat clear coat. The reducers come in three different speeds, slow, medium, and fast. Slow is for hot temperatures. It'll allow the reducer to kind of evaporate out a little bit slower since the heat is gonna make it kick. Medium is for your normal conditions, like 70 degrees. It's like what it is today. And then um, your fast reducers for really cold conditions so that it'll evaporate faster. And you're really just trying to get it to evaporate within a normal time frame based on the temperature outside. It's 70 degrees today, so we can use everything that's just normal. And medium reducer is gonna be just fine. We'll mix this up, put it in the gun, spray it, and we'll be done. So as you guys have noticed, beginning of these videos, we have a lot of really awesome sponsors that have made this build possible. We wanted to honor them by putting their name on this incredible machine. So we're going to throw some decals on, make it look a little, little bit more like a race car. And also it's going to give a little shout out to the brands that have helped make this dream a reality.
that's me. You're probably wondering how I got myself into this situation. So we've run our tape to kind of mask everything off. Now we're going to run a bead of black silicone down it to create a gasket. This one's out. All right, so that is my first time using silicone to kind of create a gasket around fenders. I haven't done it in the past because I was worried I would need to pull the over fender off for one reason or another. But after owning several wide-bodied over fendered cars, uh, I realized you never really pull the fenders off. So we're going to start doing this on all of them because it just looks so much cleaner. Um, so now that that's done, I'm really glad because I was a little nervous about it. It's the first time to ever do it. Um, we are going to put our bumpers back on. So the bumpers have been off for a while. I've had them kind of resting on the car recently just to kind of see what it looks like. But it's officially time to mount them and get them on for for it for the final time so i'm really excited to see this thing complete and everything mounted together and then we've got a few more things to paint and touch up and then we'll be ready to take this thing for a drive next on the list is our cracked passenger mirror now to fix a crack in anything you have to stop it now you'll see these cracks would just continue if we left them alone so we're going to drill holes at the end of every single one that way it won't crack anymore and then we can actually make the light look or the head What's this thing called? The mirror look pretty and finished and all that cool stuff. Now that our cracks have been stopped by the holes that we drilled, we've got to dig a channel basically over this crack so we can fill that in with some filler and that'll keep the crack from spreading, breaking, or doing anything kind of weird. We'll be able to smooth that out and paint over it. So normally I would use like a plastic epoxy for this. I don't have any, so we're just gonna use body filler. This filler I'm using is called High Tech, and it's really, really cheap, and it's, I'm, for the price and everything, this is the best filler I've found. I've tried a lot of different ones, and this stuff is great. Uh, it sands easy, it goes on smooth, even though, I mean, it's really cold in here today, and this stuff is still mixing just pretty, pretty well. All right, so that is smooth and repaired now. It feels really good. We're gonna take it back to the paint booth so we can finish it out all the way and paint it. Now it is time to prime and paint this thing and it's gonna look really, really good. Decided to paint the mirrors black just to tie it in with the whole kind of top half of the car and I think it came out really, really awesome. And it does look good sitting here, but you know where we look even better? On the road. Let's take it for a drive.
the car lowered itself while we were driving uh, in a pretty drastic way. And it was kind of hard to tell when we were in there, but when we got back, it became very evident. Basically, um, this car had the wrong strut mounts in it. I put the right ones in, which fixed all of our height issues. But uh, I was missing a piece that I know now is a little like claw clamp type thing that goes over your shock. And it keeps your shock from being able to do, well, this, what ours did. Yeah, car's too low. We established that. We ordered some different stuff. We're gonna raise it up. So just assess the damage real quick. We broke our fender right here. I'll have to fix that and respray it. And then when the shock came up, it hit our hood, which put a kind of positive dent in our hood right here. So we'll have to hammer that down and respray the hood. Um, just wish this was more exciting. We're supposed to end this video on like a happy note. The car's back on the road, everything's cool. Instead, I'm just gonna be ordering a bunch of suspension parts. We've got, uh, we've got some camber correction coming in, some new springs coming in. I'm going to have to get a strut mount to come in, and I've got to figure out what those top plates are called for the struts. Uh, so, yeah. Comments, I told you so comments below, if you have any. And I guess we'll get this sorted. We have a video scheduled to shoot next week, and this car has to be done for that. So the next time you see this car, the hood will have been resprayed, and the fender will have been re-sprayed and fixed and the suspension will be reworked and I've got a lot of work to do. And on that terrible disappointment, <laughs> it's time to say goodbye. We'll be back. Is this thing on? Yep. All right, so I lost my phone, or I lost my camera, I mean, so we're having to film this on my uh, phone. The camera will show up. No hey, big guy. Deal. But I felt like it was hey, time. Guy. Hey, buddy. I wanted to show you guys this process because I know a lot of you guys like to see this. So we broke our car, and you notice I already fixed it. The fender we just fixed the same way as the mirrors. We carved our channel, put in some fiberglass, put in some fiberglass filler, and then smoothed that out. The hood took a hammer to it. I smoothed it out with kind of a flood coat of that next or high tech or whatever filler I've been using, and uh, flattened that out as well. So we should be good to go. What we're gonna do next is we'll pull off our vinyl right here, tape off this fender. We're gonna spray this whole fender. And then we're gonna tape off the hood, the yellow portion. We've actually, my kids are in here with me, so <laughs> bear with me. Can I have my hammer? Should be fun. All right, let's get to work. I think a little guy.
pull this thing off real quick. Luckily, Mercedes uses a lot of screws in their design, which is good. I prefer that over clips. And uh, then I'll show you how we're going to fix this thing and make it look brand new. Well, as close to brand new as we can get. Let's do it. All right, so the door panel is out. We're gonna use this nonsense invisible cleaner and our long hair brush to clean everything off. There's some staining here that looks like, I don't know if it's UV staining or what. We've got some black here, um, but I wanna make sure this is really clean, especially this handle where obviously someone has grabbed a lot and it's left kind of this oily black residue. We're gonna get rid of all that as well and just get this as clean as possible before we move on to the next step. All right, this thing looks so much better already. We got all the black oily stains off. We got a lot of the dirt off of this thing. There's still some bleaching from the sun. We're gonna take care of that next. Uh, but first what we're gonna do is use some like degreaser, acetone, whatever kind of solvent you have. And we're gonna wipe the whole door down. Uh, just get it all cleaned up completely. And then we'll be ready for the next step, which is probably my favorite. proud of this. I think it came out really good. I'm really glad that we were able to recover the speaker grills because they came out awesome too. Everything looks clean. Everything looks new. Everything looks fresh. Now this color is a little bit darker than the original color that was on here. So we'll have to cross that bridge when we come to it. We'll do that. But we're going to hang this up for now until we get ready to put these back in the car and we're going to move on to the next project, which is the most expensive part of any interior. And that is the seats. I just got these things back from the upholsterer. I'm so excited. You will have noticed that I have the, had the seats pulled out this entire video. They've been at the upholsterer for about a week and a half and they look awesome. Now, a problem with Mercedes is that they make easily the most complicated seat ever conceived. And he told me that whenever I had these recovered. So having a new one is really, really great. Um, the only issue is they don't really, we couldn't find the fabric that, or the, the leather that Mercedes used. So we had to match as close as possible, which means we're gonna have to figure out how to make it match inside the car. One of the added benefits to recovering the seats, I didn't realize until I started uh, doing it or having it done on my cars, is that a lot of times if it's a really good upholsterer, um, they will rebuild the seat basically. So they'll add foam in, they'll rebuild the bolsters. So a seat that did feel flat and kind of used up and old, you'll get back and it looks and feels new. You can see these bolsters are super deep again and the ones on the side are too and they feel really, really great. Before we do that, we're gonna take the roof off. We've got some work we need to do on the headliner and kind of the surrounding parts of the roof because it came off of a different car so it doesn't match. Um, so we'll do that. That way when we put the seats in, it'll be easy to see uh, what's going on in the color differences and all that cool stuff. Let's do it. Here 
exterior. This thing feels awesome. It's like hugging my sides, which is great. I think going around turns is gonna feel great. On top of that, it just feels so much more firm. I don't know what all, that probably has a little bit to do with just the material on the outside. Maybe he built up the inside a little bit, but it really feels awesome. It feels awesome. We don't have these things bolted in. They're kind of hard to put together, and I think I'm probably gonna pull them apart again while I'm cleaning. Um, so we'll put them together kind of in the final assembly of everything. We put everything back, but just sitting in them in here, this car feels so much nicer already. And the clean carpet is helping a ton as well. Look at that. Can you see that? Yeah, it's crazy. It's gross is what it is, Eric. <laughs> Alright, so because we are actually painting some stuff a different shade of gray, I want to kind of tie the rest of the interior together. So I think we can tie this new gray from the door panels uh, into kind of the back of the car um, and also into the headliner like we painted the headliner. And it'll all make a lot of sense even though it's some different shades of gray. So we're just going to tape this up real quick. We'll spray it with that paint because it works on leather just like it does on vinyl. Uh, we'll hit this and we'll hit that and then this stuff will all match the headliner and the door panels, and I think it'll all kind of work together to make a complete interior. All right, there's so much wind out here right now. We don't have wind here, it just doesn't happen. <laughs> that thing is cooking, dude. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, we're gonna thank uh, we're gonna thank FJ Eric, who is my film guy, for getting the new mic. That is probably can you hear any air, wind noise through it right now? No wind. You're welcome, everyone. Thank FJ Eric in the comments for getting us a good mic. We've got some fastening that still needs to happen, clips that broke and stuff that we'll have to take care of. But overall, I'm pretty happy with the uh, end result. The wind is trying to die down. So I think that we are going to move from the door panels, go back to the rear, and make the rear leather parts match our new door panels. So every time I sat in this car before doing this, it felt really gross. Like the seats were stained and kind of oily feeling. The door panels were very oily and just torn and nasty. And um, sitting in this car now, it does, honestly, not exaggerating, it doesn't feel like the same car. It feels totally different. Um, everything's clean, everything smells good. It just feels nice and the seats especially have changed the whole feeling of the car. I mean, they feel new, first of all, but also they're really, they're just great, just great. So I'm really happy with this. I was a bit concerned about the different shades of gray we have going on in this interior, but luckily Mercedes used a lot of different shades in this car anyway, so it actually kind of all makes sense and works. Now, you'll notice maybe a few pieces missing if you have a keen eye, so we'll do that off camera. I'm not really concerned about it. This is the final form for you guys of the interior. 
Okay, so before we get into this, I feel like I need to make an explanation. I am a little bit sick, so my voice sounds weird, and we're using a new microphone. So all kinds of audio stuff going on today. Hopefully this makes it better. We've been working on kind of upping our production value with lighting and better cameras and lenses and stuff, and the mic is the next step towards that. Unfortunately, my voice isn't wanting to cooperate with the mic. So we're gonna do our best to make this video really good. All right, so this is a factory SL500 rear spring. We're going to rework our whole suspension because it's just too low. It's not fun to drive. It does look super, super cool. Cut to the footage of it driving down the street. But it's not, it's not fun. It's too low, it scrapes, it's, it makes all kinds of racket, and I don't like it. So we're gonna raise it up, and the way we're gonna do that is by putting in shorter springs than stock, but longer springs than what's in there. Now, we did do something on this car that uh, not as many of you guys got upset about as I thought, but I did get a lot of questions, and it's cut the springs. And I'm gonna tell you why we're cutting the springs on this car. There is a specific reason why you're able to cut the springs on this car and why I think it's safe. Now, I will say this. There's a million things on the internet to tell you why it's dangerous. There's a million things to tell you why it's not that dangerous, and that's for basically every single fact of life. If you do your own research, you're gonna come up with your own assumptions and your own ideas. So, I'm just gonna tell you what I've experienced based on doing this three times with the third car I've done it on. I've done it wrong, I've done it right, and then this car will be the third one. I'm doing it right on this one too, and it's gonna work just fine. We cut three coils off the back, and three and a half off the front, and it was too much, but it does give us a really good idea of where this one needs to be cut. So what we're gonna do, is we're gonna do two off the front, two off the rear. I think that that should set us up about an inch higher than it is right now. And I think that's gonna be a really comfortable ride height. It'll still look very low. It's not gonna be slammed by any means, but we'll be able to drive it hard and won't have to really worry about anything messing up. So we're gonna go ahead and pre-cut all of these because we've got experience with this spring already. And then we'll take it over to my house where the car has been parked since the suspension broke and we did all the other stuff. And we'll install them and see what it does to the ride. So one of the biggest concerns about cutting springs um, that I've found on the internet is that they're gonna fall out if your spring unloads or if your suspension unloads. So when you do cut them, if you do decide to cut them at your own discretion, you gotta make sure that when the suspension is unloaded all the way, that the spring doesn't move around. Now if you look at ours right here, you can see this side is unloaded and the spring is solid. But the reason we're gonna make them longer, one of the reasons, is because when you lift the other side off the ground, and the sway bar unloads all the way, you can't actually move it around slightly. And so if we were to ever like jump the car, I guess, <laughs> the spring could potentially come out maybe, I don't know. But either way, we're gonna avoid all of that by putting in a longer spring. That way we don't have to worry about the spring ever unloading. Let me drink some of my hot tea. We're going to uh, unbolt our shock, drop the, swing, the control arm down, pull the spring out. We'll throw a new one in and just see what happens. This one looks wider. That's what I thought. Is that a rear? This is what? Is that a rear? And that's the front? No, these these are supposed to be the rears. But the ones they sent us look exactly like this. So I'm gonna check this. This could be the wrong one because they had the wrong they had the wrong top mount in this side too. <laughs> and without anybody knowing <laughs> I appreciate it instead of cutting these though we're going to use the miracle of movie magic <laughs> there we go that'll work so it may be too high but that's easier to fix than too low Wheels are light. They're really light to be as big as they are. It's 
So you'll notice like I'm using things like 3 8 inch drive ratchets to put wheels on. I have definitely underestimated the importance of my shop. It's been so nice having a place where I can put cars inside and work on them inside away from wind and crazy lighting issues and have all my tools in one place. So we are definitely uh, under tooled in this situation. It's making it take a little bit longer. So let's see what we did. Oh, nice. I love that. Oh, thank goodness. I tell you what though, I'm glad we didn't go any lower. That's great. That's great. I think that's gonna just work. All right, so it is a new day and uh, we went ahead and finished the front end. We did the other side and we went ahead and did the back over there, but I can't show that to you because we actually are doing a pretty good bit of modification on the back um, to fix a couple of issues. The issues we're going to address is one, the lowness. It's just too low. Uh, we want it to match the front. I love the way the front's sitting now, so we'll fix that. Um, and then also the camber, if you look directly down over the fender, you can't even see the wheel because it's tilted. You can't see the top because it's tilted in so far, which like if we were going for like super stance, it'd be cool. We'd push it out really far and make it real cambered, but we're not. We want something that drives really great. So um, we're going to fix the camber as well, and I'll show you how we're going to do that. First, we're going to do, uh, we're going to roll this thing back up onto a block just so I can get a jack underneath it. We'll lift it up and we'll start taking stuff apart. So, but I don't want to drive it far because it needs an alignment and I don't want to blow through these tires. I took like a sharpie or a paintbrush and drew a rat doing a burnout. <laughs> So because we got the wrong springs, we can compare all three. So this is our extreme drop, this is our moderate drop, and then this is our stock. So you can see we're actually not taking that much off of it this time, um, which makes me feel more comfortable and means that our suspension will handle much better. I'm very frustrated with this car right now. There we go. Okay, got it. We have a camber problem. As you've noticed, when we lowered the rear, the rear wheels tilted in really, really hard and it just didn't look cool. So we're gonna fix it. It's gonna make our handling a lot better. It's gonna make our launching a lot better because this thing gets real squirrely when you launch it right now. Um, it's just gonna make everything better. It's also gonna make it look better because the wheels will feel the, uh, the wheel wells a lot better. And the way we're going to adjust it is by replacing this thing with this. So this is a control, a control arm I found on eBay. As you can see, it screws in and out to change the length, and as you change the length of the top control arm, you change your camber. I think it's also adjusting our toe, so I don't know, we'll have to deal with that, but it will fix our camber and make everything better. This is the least fun kind of suspension work to do, but I'm also very excited about it. It's, it's a weird situation we're in here. Let's throw it in. Okay, slow down, go a little bit, right there, perfect. We did it. It is done. Our ride height is complete. I am happy with it. I think it's a good height. It looks low, but it also looks drivable. And we picked up a major amount of spring by adding back 
these coils and I think the comfort level is gonna go way, way up. So we'll test drive it and find out. But more importantly than any of that, we corrected a lot of things. So you guys remember in the first drive where we drove this thing, it failed and the shock came up into the hood and I had to do a bunch of paint repair. It was just a nightmare. So we fixed that with the front, with the front um, suspension. Front suspension also was riding really, really rough. So adding that coil and a half back, which is a lot, um, is gonna fix that completely. It'll soften it up and make it feel really, really good. Um, and then same in the rear. The rear was just too low and um, we fixed that height. And then on top of that, with our adjustable control arms, we we're able to fix our camber as well, which makes the car look wider. I mean, it literally looks way, way wider in the back just having those wheels tilted up. Now, this isn't our final camber adjustment. I'm gonna get it as close to zero as possible just because I like that look better and it's gonna fill out the wheel wells even more. Um, but this is where we're gonna roll with it for now and I'll tinker with it later off camera just when I'm feeling like torturing myself a little bit. Overall, I'm really, really happy with the design of this suspension and with that, Everyone builds cars for a reason. The reason I build cars has always been about creative expression. I wanted to take something that was in my head and put it into the real world. And as I got older, I wanted to use that to help people. About a year ago, I got this SL500 on a trade deal. I didn't know what I was gonna do with it, but it was too good of a deal to pass up. And a couple months later, I found out that my uncle was diagnosed with ALS disease. If you're not familiar with what ALS is, it's a neurodegenerative disease that affects the nerve cells in your brain and spinal cord. Basically removes function to do things that you take for granted every single day. By the time I'd seen my uncle, he had had it for about two or three months and had lost most of his ability to talk and was having a little bit of trouble getting around. And The doctors had told us that it was progressing uh, pretty aggressively. After leaving that visit with my uncle, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with the SL500. It was build it and auction it off to support ALS, but also just to bring awareness to this disease that so many people are struggling with. So I reached out to Tecron and they were all about the idea and we had to get to work. We knew we were on a time crunch and so we wanted to customize and build this thing as fast as possible. We hired out all the other work in the shop so we could focus all of our attention on this car. We even asked for some help from some subscribers and we got to work making this thing low, wide, and loud. We did that by using a BMW wide body kit, a Nissan spoiler, and an Audi front lip to make sure that there was no other SL500 like this on the road ever. We finished that off with a custom livery painted by me that features all the sponsors that helped us get this incredible project done. It was really important to me that my uncle see the car in person before the sale and everything else happened. So we loaded the car up on my trailer behind a motorhome and made the six hour trip to his home in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Pulling up to his house was incredible. He was outside in his driveway with all of his friends and family members that have been walking with him through uh, this whole process and everybody loved the car. Talking about how good it looked in person and, and it was just a really awesome experience to, to get to be there with them and show them this thing that I'd spent so much time uh, in, in effort in building over the past several months. So the first question Uncle Herb asked me when we got there was, where is the purple? And that's because he is a huge LSU fan. And from the onset of this livery, we knew we wanted to incorporate the colors of that team, which is purple and yellow. Well, the yellow was there, but I had pre-cut a purple stripe anticipating that uh, he would ask me where the purple was. So we actually put the final touch on the livery in his driveway, which is a purple stripe directly down the center of the car. And I think it looks awesome. And every time I look at it, I think about him and his family and what they mean to me. The number 37 and the quote on the side of the door represent the foundation we chose to give to, Team Gleason. They helped Uncle Herb out tremendously through this process, as well as his family. And it's an organization that's really close to my heart, so it's one that I wanted to donate to. Team Gleason headquarters is actually in New Orleans, Louisiana. It's only about an hour from my uncle's house. Unfortunately, we hit a huge bump in the road and apparently the Mercedes shifted about an inch to the left. So the rear tire of the Mercedes contacted the rear tire of the trailer and did what I can only describe as a double blowout. We had a spare tire for the trailer, which was good, but we did not have a spare tire for the Mercedes. So we got to get the car to Team Gleason, but we weren't able to take it off of the trailer. Still, everyone got to see the car. They got to take pictures with it. We got to meet everyone that's on staff at Team Gleason. And then Kearney actually took us inside to show us what they're working on for people living with ALS right now. This is our assistive technology room. My name is Kearney Gay, um, Director of Development um, and Partnerships for, for Team Gleason. We directly impact individuals with ALS. 
We provide technology, uh, insurance assistance on Medicare, and directly putting that back into people to help them live more productive lives. We need that. That's something we all want, to find a cure for this disease. But in the meantime, people need help uh, to live with this disease so they can wait for the time that there is a cure. And that's what Team Gleason does. Um, we're the biggest uh, that I know of that does that specific work. They let me use some of the tech that they're developing for ALS patients. And I think the coolest thing there is the eye tracking technology. Within minutes, I was able to control an iPad, search the internet, type, turn on a TV, turn on lights, adjust the thermostat, all just by moving my eyes. It's truly incredible and it opens up a whole new window of possibilities for ALS patients to live more independently. If you want to donate to Team Gleason, I'm going to leave a link in the description below so that you can do that to help fund the research and work that they are doing every single day to help ALS patients. And also, we're going to auction this car off. Now, 100% of the proceeds from this auction are going to go directly to Team Gleason. So we'll be able to support them as a channel and as a community, as well as just giving individually. The auction is going to go live a month after today. So we will post a link to the auction in this video, as well as all the other Mercedes videos when that auction does go live. Now we're not just auctioning off the car. We're also going to include a bunch of stuff from different sponsors of the build, including a fully stocked Sonic Tools backpack. I don't even think these are out yet, but one will go with the car. We're going to include some knock around sunglasses, several bottles of Tecron Complete fuel system cleaner, as well as that Okai electric scooter that we advertised just a few videos ago. So you're going to take this car to the track, order some shows, you're going to be fully set up. Huge thank you to all the sponsors that made this build possible, to Tecron, to Knock Around, Chemical Guys, Sonic Tools, and Continental. We would not have been able to do it without you guys. And another massive thank you to all the guys that came and helped build this thing early on. Justin, James from Carnivores, and Dan from Southern Import Collective. That made such a huge difference and it's always an awesome time when we get to build with subscribers. Finally, huge thank you to Team Gleason for everything you've done for my family, but also for all the other families that are dealing with this horrible disease. You guys are making it so much easier on people who are struggling with ALS. Whether you're a subscriber or this is the first built video you've ever seen, you are making this possible. I literally would not be able to build these cars and give them away and donate to these awesome charities. Thank you so much for watching the videos. You're making this a possibility and we wouldn't be able to do it without you. We'll see you in the next one.